Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Title of the message tonight is The Portrait of the King. The Portrait of the King. Heavenly Father, you know what I stand in need of tonight, dear Lord, that you would touch me, touch my voice. Lord, give me the power to preach. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive me of any sin, Lord. I don't want to stand in your way tonight, dear God, that you would use your message. Lord, convict those tonight who are listening. Lord, that you would touch their hearts with your word as only you can. We want to get out of the way and let you take control. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. A portrait is a painting, a drawing, an engraving of a person, especially one depicting only the, the face, head, and the shoulders. And throughout centuries, men have tried to capture a portrait of the world's most famous public figure. Jesus Christ. And some of the most famous works of art on Jesus Christ, you think of, of course, the, the Last Supper, with painted by Leonardo da Vinci. We used to actually have a copy of that down in the, the fellowship building, if you, if you remember. That is a very, very famous painting. You see that in a lot of places. Another one is The Last Judgment. That was by Michelangelo. That's the famous painting in the Sistine Chapel, the wall behind the altar there at the Vatican City. Christ the Redeemer. That is that statue there in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. That 98 foot tall, 700 ton statue of, of Christ with his, with his arms outstretched there in Rio de Janeiro, Paul Landowski was the creator of that, and there were several, several architects, several people who contributed to that. Salvator Mundi, that means Savior of the World. That was actually another portrait painted by Leonardo da Vinci, and it was recovered not too long ago. And back in 2012, it sold for $450 million in, in New York. Those are some of the most famous, some of the most common works of art. When you think of Jesus, I'm sure you've seen some of these paintings at one time or another by various artists. But some of the, the famous ones and the most common ones you see, you see Jesus getting baptized. The one of him, him and John the Baptist. You see the picture um, at the tomb with Mary Magdalene. The picture of him feeding the 5,000, standing at the door and knocking in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying. You see these, these common works of art of, of our Savior. And though there be many works of art that portray Jesus Christ, in every one of them, the artist had to use a lot of liberty, a lot of imagination, because the Scripture isn't dogmatic, it isn't detailed when it comes to what our Savior looked like during His first coming. We only have a few details. And a lot of those details that we have on what Jesus looked like was during His crucifixion. We know, for example, that Jesus had a beard. 
We know that his beard was plucked. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter number 50. We know that his face was disfigured. It was mutilated at the time of crucifixion. They beat him so badly, his face had been literally mutilated. His body was like hamburger meat. They had beaten him so bad. He was bruised, the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 53. His hands and his side were pierced, the Bible tells us in the book of John, specifically in, verse, in chapter number 20. But we don't know the color of his hair. We don't know the color of his eyes. We don't know if he had long hair or not. We don't know how tall he was, how much he weighed. We don't know the complexion of his skin. The artists who have depicted him and have painted him had to use a lot of liberties. However, in the book of Revelation, the Word of God has given us a portrait, a powerful portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ that no artist could ever do any justice to. And this is the por portrait of the post-incarnate Jesus Christ in a glorified body. And we're looking tonight at the title, the subject, The Portrait of the King. And we look here in Revelation chapter 19, and verse number 11, and I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. To have a beautiful portrait, you must capture the character of the individual that you are painting, that you are drawing, that you are photographing. Skylum Software, they are a developing company, who is well known for their photo editing software, they published an article on how to capture the, the character of someone to really make a portrait mean something and really make a portrait matter. And to quote from their article directly, and I quote, to capture character means to capture the essence of who your subject is. What do they think? What do they feel? How do they express themselves? Although we got a very clear picture of this at Jesus Christ at His first coming, it's very important that you realize that when Jesus Christ comes again, He's not coming the way He did the first time. He's not coming as a little babe in the manger, born of a virgin. He's not coming as the Lamb who is... Uh, going to be led to the slaughter, as the Bible says in, in Isaiah. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, we see the essence of His character as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when we look at the portrait of the King, number one, we see the King's character. What is the essence of His character? The first part of verse number 11, And I saw... Heaven opened. Flip back, if you would, to Revelation chapter number 6. Revelation chapter number 6. And we just left chapter number 19, which is literally the climax of the entire Bible. It is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Everything leads up to that point. And heaven is opened and Jesus Christ descends on a white horse. But here in Revelation chapter number 6, there's another white horse before this. Verse number 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. Here in Revelation chapter number 6, this writer specifically will bring peace to the earth that it will be false and it will be temporary. He was not from heaven. War, famine, and death, those are the other three horsemen of the apocalypse. 
will follow this writer. H.A. Ironside said that he was, in quote, doomed to disappointment. This is the Antichrist. This is the second person of the Satanic Trinity. The one who will rise to fame, he'll rise to power during the Great Tribulation, and he'll attempt to destroy the work of Jesus Christ once and for all, and he will fail. But in Revelation chapter 19, the Bible says, And I saw heaven opened. This is the portrait of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There's no other name above this name. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. Where did it come? It come from heaven, the throne room of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. <coughs> Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Where is the right hand of God? In the throne room of heaven. Hebrews 9.28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him shall He appear the second time without sin unto salvation. His character, the King's character. A message the Lord gave, gave me before in this, in this very chapter was who's that writing on the white horse, and the introduction was it's not the Antichrist, and it's not Adam or a son of Adam, it's not a fictional character, but it's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we learn more about his character. It says there in chapter 19, verse 11, in our key verse, says, Faithful and true. Faithful and true. That word faithful comes from the Greek word pistos, which is trusty. It is a person who shows themselves faithful, one who uh, kept their plighted faith, or one who's worthy of trust. They're somebody who can be relied on. That word true there is from the Greek word alephinos, is one that which has not only has the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name. In every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name, real, true, and genuine. There's only one in the entire universe who meets that description. And that is the character of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 says... Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. He's faithful. He's true. Hebrews 7, 24 and 25. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by Him, seeing He ever liveth to make intercession for them. The night I trusted in Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior and put faith in Him, He saved me to the uttermost. Well, how do you know that, preacher? Because He's faithful and He's true. He's faithful to save. He was faithful to go to the cross. 
He was faithful to do what He said He was going to do, and He's faithful to come again. If you turn back, stay in the book of Revelation, but if you turn back to chapter number 5, this book is the only prophetic book in the New Testament. It's divided into three parts. Hopefully you know these by now. There's the things which were, which is verse 1, I believe. The things which are, which is chapter 1 through about midway through chapter 3. And then there's the things which will be hereafter. That's pretty much chapter 4 on out. The church is the center of attention in chapters 4 and 5. Even though it is still the things which will be hereafter, the church is still the center of attention. So the subject now, the, the, the subject is the church, but the scenery is no longer on earth. The scenery is in heaven. The rapture of the church has taken place. We're now in eternity. And those judgments, God before, before Christ can return, this world needs to be judged. That's going to be the great tribulation. The tribulation and the great tribulation. But if you look here in chapter number 5, and th this is the, the first seven seals that, they're, um, that John's referring to here. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Verse number 5 there. Uh, uh, I've skipped verse number 4. I apologize. says, And I wept much because no man was found worthy. But look at verse number 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. In Ezekiel, back when Israel had rebelled, and when they were now known as the bloody city, and that they were rebelling from God, and there in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, it says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. All throughout the book of Ezekiel, you'll see a common phrase there. Son of man. I think it's 92 times. 92 of the 104 times it's in the Bible. It's in the book of Ezekiel. may have those off one or two, but that's about right. And of those, for example, in chapter 22, if you look at verse 24, he says, Son of man. That word man is... The Hebrew word Adam, which is Adam. That's a human being. A hypocrite. Adam, a failure. All the sons of Adam, mankind, were failures. We've come short. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But when you look at Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, and I sought for a man among them. That Hebrew word man is is another word. It's not the word for Adam. It's the word is actually translated Ish, which is a certain man, a champion, a great mighty man, a man of high degree. There's only one who can stand in the gap, and there's only one who can make up the hedge. You're not looking at him. It's not Adam. It's not the sons of Adam. But it's here in Revelation 19, verse number 11, when heaven's open, it's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's his character. That's who the book of Revelation is portraying for us. He's perfect in every way. He'll save you to the uttermost. The Bible says he died once for all, and then what the high priest couldn't do, he did. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. The portrait of the king. The very essence of his character is that he, God Almighty, created 
all things. He was God manifested in the flesh. He fulfilled prophecy. The Bible says He's a lamb without spot or blemish. He became the ultimate sacrifice for sin. He died and rose again on the third day, ascended up into heaven. And friends, one day He is coming back. We see the portrait of the king. Number one, the king's character. Number two, the king's countenance. Look at chapter 19, verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Flip back if you would. Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. And let's start out in verse number 10. Now this is not the second coming, but this is still John seeing the, the post-incarnate Christ in his, in his glory. Revelation chapter 1, look at verse number 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, this is John the Apostle, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, look at this, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. Remember that. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. We see the king's character. Number two, we see the king's countenance. That word countenance is a person's face or facial expression. And again, we get more details of, of Christ in a post-incarnate glorified body than we do when he was here the first time. And we read earlier about His second coming in, in chapter 19, verse 12. And now this is Him before John at, at Patmos. And let's start with His head. His, his hair, His head and His hair was white like wool. The Bible says white as snow. That means that He is eternal. Read uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 9. And the Bible tells us that His second coming... He has many crowns that is a name written that no man knew but he himself. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Referring to his insight. Do you know Jesus, is, Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he's looking at us right now and he knows everything. He knows the very intent of your heart. He knows everything you stand in need of. You may have the, the mindset that, that you have everything figured out. You may have the mindset that no one knows what you're going through. You may be confused. You may not know what you're in need of. He knows everything. He understands. He knows. His feet like unto fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. I wonder what that's referring to. We talk so much about the love of God and thank the Lord for it. And He is the perfect God. And thank God He is the God of love. But you know what else He is? 
He's the God of judgment. His voice has the sound of many waters. That's His authority. Boy, when He speaks, we don't need to... When He tells us to do something, folks, we don't need to pray about it. When He tells us to do something, boy, we don't need it. Well, let me, let me verify that, Lord. Let me check out the old commentary. Let me read my, my comment. I'll, I'll let you know. We don't need that. The church was built by Him and for Him and on Him. This is His Word. In the beginning, He was past tense. The Bible says a sword out of His mouth. That's referring to His, his Word. Sharper than any two-edged sword. His hand. In His right hand, He had seven stars. We read that verse earlier about He created everything. All things were created by Him and for Him. He has a control of the entire universe. His face, the countenance was as the sun shineth in His strength. This is referring to His glory. Try staring at the sun. You can't do it. We see the king's countenance. And then last of all, let's look at the king's clothes. Look at here in verse number 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. I don't care who the artist is. I don't care where they come from. No one can paint a portrait like this. No one can. And when we look at the clothes, the, the portrait of the king, we look at the king's clothes. In Revelation 1, the verses we read earlier, when the Lord is there in front of John, the, the Bible says uh, that he had a garment down to the foot and girt about the, the paps with a golden girdle. He was wearing the high priestly garments. He's our high priest. Friends, He is righteous. That word justified means God has declared us righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ. In His second coming, he, He's clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. The Bible says in Isaiah 63, 1-4, Who is that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Basra that is as glorious in His apparel Traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thy apparel, in thy garments like him that treadeth in wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stay in all my raiment. For the day of vengeance is mine heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. The blood on his garments. Friends, we cannot escape the blood of Jesus Christ. Some way or another, sometime in your life, you are either going to have to accept him, or you're going to reject him. There's no way around it. That is the only way to salvation. The message we heard this morning about religious acts, that will not save you. Being religious will not save you. Being a good person does not save you. Being a good person will send you to hell because you're just being good in the eyes of man because in the eyes of God there is none righteous. No, not one. To quote M.R.D. Hahn, he said, Men in all ages have tried, have tried to escape the blood of Christ, but a Christ without blood can be no Savior. 